Welcome to panel two. Do democracies everywhere need religious freedom in order to be liberal and to last? I'm Daniel Philpot from the University of Notre Dame and pleased to moderate our uh, final panel of the day. The title of the panel suggests that it is an open, disputable question whether the liberal character of democracies depends on religious freedom. Now, liberal can mean many things, but at its core, it means freedom for the individual. Others might also add for civil society institutions. Is religious freedom then, and perhaps the energies of religion that it releases, in some way critical for the health of liberal democracy? Or is there something about religious faith and the religion, religion's language and religious behavior that it unleashes that threatens or at least stands in tension with other freedoms and perhaps the broader health of liberal democracy? These are the questions before us and that our panelists will address. Let me introduce our panelists in the order that they will speak. First, there's John Diulio in the red tie, who is the Frederick Fox Leadership Professor of Politics, Religion, and Civil Society and Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published over a dozen books, plus hundreds of scholarly and popular articles and reports on American politics, healthcare policy, crime policy, religious nonprofits, and many other topics. A few of his most recent publications, if I read them all, I think we would be here till the winter, but I'll re mention a couple whose titles I really like. Godly Republic, A Centrist Blueprint for America's Faith-Based Future, and Mayberry Machiavelli's After All, Why Judging George W. Bush is Never as Easy as It Seems. <laughs> so it's a couple that I want to order on Amazon as soon as I get a chance. Um, second will be Professor Marcy Hamilton, who holds the Paul R. Vukul Chair in Public Law at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, Yeshiva University. Professor Hamilton specializes in constitutional law with an emphasis on church-state issues. Her books include God versus the Gavel, Religion and the Rule of Law, and Justice Denied, What America Must Do to Protect Its Children. Professor Hamilton has emerged as an advocate for victims of sexual abuse by religious organizations, and much of her recent work deals with the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal. Hamilton has emerged as the leading national expert on child sex abuse statutes of lim limitation laws, and manages the informational website, and I'll spell it so you can put it in your browser, sol-reform.com, which details the status of these laws in each state. Then we have Professor Mark Lilla, Professor of Humanities at Columbia University, who specializes in intellectual history with a particular focus on Western political and religious thought. Before moving to Columbia in 2007, he taught in the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago and at New York University. A regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, he is the author of The Stillborn God, Religion, Politics, in the Modern West. Reckless Mind, Intellectuals and Politics, and G.B. Vico, The Making of an Anti-Modern. Finally, um, down at the end here is Mark Rienzi, who is an assistant professor at the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law, where he teaches courses on constitutional law, religious liberty, torts, and evidence. His scholarly research and interest center on the 14th Amendment, free exercise of religion, and freedom of speech. Rienzi has been invited to lecture at Harvard Law School, Columbia University Law School, Georgetown University Law Center, Boston College Law School, Notre Dame Law School, the National Press Club, and the U.S. Capitol. Now, the, the questions for this panel, I'll state very briefly, and then we'll uh, hear from our, our uh, panelists. So again, the, the panel in, in general is, do democracies everywhere need religious freedom in order to be liberal and to last. Again, we got that everywhere in there. Um, first question, does liberal democracy require a distinct and robust right to religious freedom? 
In other words, do democracies lose something if they protect freedom of speech or assembly, say, with, without recording respect to a specifically articulated and substantive right to religious freedom? Why or why not? Second, does religious freedom in a liberal democracy require a right to bring religious-based convictions and arguments into public discourse and political debate? Even if religious people have a right to bring religious convictions into the public sphere, is there nevertheless an ethic that favors translating religiously-based claims into secular language? The third question is about civil society, whether religious elements of uh, civil society have some distinctive contribution to liberal democracy. And then finally is whether some democracies, uh, perhaps because of cultural, historical, or religious reasons, um, can remain stable and flourish without robust protections for religious freedom. Is that possibility, is that category a possibility and a robust one? So uh, let's, let's begin then. Um, I'm having our, we recommend five to 10 minutes, but I'm gonna keep a strict 12. And uh, so we can have plenty of time for a moderated discussion and then maybe some questions. So, uh, Professor Diolio. Oh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real, thank you. And it's an honor so. to be here. Uh, I wanna thank uh, uh, Tom Farr and Tim Shaw. And there's so many people here uh, who uh, I know from various times and walks uh, of my life. Um, you know, uh, just to, to say hello to Professor Macedo, whose uh, talk was uh, spectacular and I appreciated it. Stanley Carlson Tees, my old uh, White House colleague, Dr. Byron Johnson is here, and I, uh, my old uh, Penn uh, colleague, my rabbi is here, uh, David Saperstein. Hello, David, and uh, Richard Fulton. So many folks uh, here, and it's an honor to be here and a real pleasure. Now, I've been here before, so I, I usually say, you know, I, I get invited places twice. The first time to speak and the second time to apologize for what I said the first time. So, <laughs> so I apologize for what I said the last time I was here. And in advance, I apologize for what I'm about to, <laughs> about to say. It's a down payment. Um, I'm gonna answer the two questions, or at least a couple of those questions, more or less directly. And then I'm gonna uh, take the remainder or balance of my time, Mr. Chairman, uh, to uh, say a, a bit about how I would hope we, we not just this, this distinguished panel, uh, but, uh, but we more generally, can come to approach these sorts of questions about religion in the public square and a liberal democracy such as this great liberal democracy of ours. So the question about religious convictions and whether they should figure in the public square to me is a fairly easy question to answer, a big, a big affirmative yes. Um, I find it difficult, I would find it difficult to tell the story of American political history, social history without referencing the lives uh, of people who uh, including up to through and including the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century that you know without telling the, the stories of people who brought religious convictions very explicitly uh, into the public square. And if you look at not only what past presidents but recent presidents including the present president uh, Barack, Barack Obama uh, look at their public discourse it's punctuated uh, with religious references but also with deeper religious sensibilities. There is, I'm not here to promote a book, I have no, uh, but there's a wonderful book by uh, Reverend Joshua Dubois, who was the first uh, director of the White House faith-based <coughs> office under President Obama, a wonderful young guy who uh, has a book out called Presidential Devotionals, and it's the daily devotionals that he gave to President uh, Obama each day, and uh, you know, little stories and anecdotes wrapped around each. I mean, if you look at President Obama's speech, clearly he's somebody who brings his religious convictions uh, as a Christian into the public square on a regular basis, as have other presidents. So that, that, that question I know is complicated and can be further complicated, or I got this word today, problematized, uh, but uh, you know, I, I'm gonna leave that there. But the second question to me is the more important one, frankly. And it may, in some, to some of you, may constitute a qualification to the answer I just gave. Should people who bring religious convictions into the public square, people who are faith motivated in expressing their views about particular public policy issues or programs, should they be expected uh, to translate uh, those convictions, those religious convictions, those faith motivations into a secular or civic or neutral vernacular? And to me, the answer to that question is hell yes. And I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll personalize it. And I'm a Roman Catholic, uh, uh, maybe here, I'm not sure. Uh, that will pass exactly. I think I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a Roman Catholic, okay? I don't want to get to the theology issues, but I'm a Roman I was raised as a Catholic. I'm a practicing Catholic. And I have views on abortion, and I have views on labor organizing and union rights. And I grew up in a you know, household where we, our political philosophy could be summarized as unions are good, abortions are not. Um, and I pretty much still believe that. 
and also with respect to uh, you know, programs for the poor and the affirmative obligation of government, including the national government, to step in uh, when civil institutions and lower levels of government don't. And I could rationalize and justify each of the positions I hold on those three issues and many others in relation to my Catholic faith. But alas, the, the simple fact is that most of my fellow Americans are not Catholic. Uh, they are people of many other faiths, and many of them are people of no faiths. Uh, the Pew survey tells us that 15% of all Americans now are nuns. That's N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. Uh, I got very excited when I heard that 15% of Americans were nuns. Oh, wow. <laughs> Matt Heart of Mary is really cleaning, uh, batting, cleaning up. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know I, could, I could go into the catechetical, you know, uh, trenches and talk about Catholic concepts like solidarity and subsidiarity, which apparently no spell check can figure out. Um, but, but that's not meaningful to most of my fellow citizens. The 300 million plus citizen souls in this republic, in this liberal democracy, are people to whom I have obligations and responsibilities to explain myself. And if it's not enough to say, you know, you know, the catechism, don't leave home or Rome without it, uh, I have to have other reasons, and I should be expected and required. Moreover, there are fellow Catholics, and I know I need not tell people at Georgetown uh, this, there are Catholics don't all agree on what their own theological and so for other traditions uh, would have them uh, do. And then there are prudential considerations uh, that differ from person to person. So it, to me, it seems also like a more complicated, difficult, but to me, a fairly straightforward question. So yes, yes to both of those. But let me conclude by saying uh, more generally, how I, uh, how I would suggest um, we come to approach these sorts of questions about religion in the public square in this liber great liberal democracy of ours. A couple of weeks ago, I had the uh, uh, privilege to be down at Southern Methodist University uh, at the Presidential History Center, and I was part of a conference with all the former, all of the uh, uh, persons who have directed the White House Office of Faith-Based Initiatives, both the, those that followed me in the uh, Bush administration and then the first two directors, uh, the great Reverend Dubois and the wonderful uh, Dr. Melissa Rogers, uh, now in office in the Obama administration. And so we had a couple days down there to talk and discuss and so forth, and a certain kind of fellowship comes from that experience wherever you're coming from because you're at an intersection of religion and politics <coughs> where the kinds of questions that we're discussing here today uh, are discussed in real time. <laughs> And you, don't, you cannot cite Foucault. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and, you can't, and you can't punt. You have, to, you have to come down somewhere. And having had that experience, the thing I think that each of us, the, the four or five of us who were there for a couple of days, I think one thing we would all agree on is how important it is to remember that while philosophical considerations are important to weigh, and while you know, certainly um, it's very important to you know, stare straight into the eyes of the real conflicts we have over things like the HHS mandate and so forth. Like not to say, oh, we're all, it's just all a big misunderstanding. It's not. It's not. There are multiple and competing values at stake. But how do we approach it? What I would just suggest by way of concluding is when we talk about these questions about religion and liberal democracy, let's try to, let's try to be a little more inductive and problem-centered. For example, there are, uh, every year in this country, millions of kids who go hungry in the summer. Why? because during the nine months of the year when they're in school, they get free and reduced priced meals delivered in school, right, through the US, United States Department of Agriculture's program. Summer months come, school's out, hunger spikes, childhood hunger or what the USDA calls um, extreme food insecurity goes up. That's a well-documented fact. In some states, only about 5% of the kids who get the free and reduced priced meals get them in the summer as a result. Now, we want to improve that. The Bush administration wanted to, the Obama administration's tried to. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? There's no way to do that. There's no way to deliver those meals without public, private, religious, secular partnerships that involve government agencies at all levels, nonprofits, secular and religious, <laughs> Methodists, Muslims, Mormons, Quakers, Catholics, Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, atheists, agnostics, working together in common. How are they going to work together in common? They're going to have to find some way to accommodate. Issues will come up. They do come up. But just remember this. A third of all the daycare in America is provided and supplied through religious organizations right now in partnership with government in many cases. 40% or so of welfare to work programs are supplied through religious nonprofits, people who come into the public. So hundreds of hospitals right, uh, have religious foundations and religious or religious nonprofit boards. I'm not saying that this means, okay, let's all go to our neutral corners and not fuss and fight about it or sue each other. I like it when we sue each other. It's a lot better than the alternative ways of resolving conflict. But it's important to remember that we're not going to be able to achieve a lot of our common good objectives if all we can do is, on the one side, 
to claim against each other, and on the other side, basically say, well, you know, to be considered, we'll, we'll punt on these issues, we'll get back to them later. There's no later, uh, it, it's, it's now. And so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel. I'm very much looking forward to what my esteemed colleagues have to say, so thank you. Okay. Professor Hamilton. Yeah. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Tom Farr and also Tim Shaw and uh, just point out that this uh, religious freedom project is extraordinarily uh, tolerant, uh, that I was permitted to come on to Georgetown's <laughs> campus uh, as one of the most vocal critics and gadflies of the bishops is, uh, well, it's refreshing. That's nice. Uh, so, do you need religious liberty? Absolutely. Uh, and the reason we have to have it is because the two most authoritative structures of human existence over history are the state and religion. It is not possible to cooperate as a society without both being part of the mixture. But that's just uh, a starting point. The, the question is really, what do we mean by religious liberty? And I would go back to the framing generation, which was very explicit that by liberty, they did not mean licentiousness. There were limits to liberty. And in fact, there are state constitutions still that include the term licentiousness as forbidden as part of the liberty. What did licentiousness include? Well, it included uh, all sorts of behaviors at the time, but it included sex with children, sex with animals, inappropriate marriages, as in polygamy, et cetera. So from the very beginning, we've understood religious liberty as a limited concept. It's never been absolute in the United States. There's one absolute right in the entire United States Constitution, and it makes us one of the leading democracies in the world. It's the absolute right to believe anything you want. If you want to deny the Holocaust in the United States, you go right at it. You have the right to do that. But after that absolute right, the government always has the capacity to explain itself why it needs to regulate. And so we are always going to have the question of whether or not this fact scenario is one in which the religious liberty claimant should win or lose. We will never avoid that. Uh, and speaking in abstractions doesn't get you out of the reality that religious liberty is not licentiousness. But to put it another way, in the way that the Supreme Court has repeatedly put it, uh, is that we have a system of ordered liberty. Not liberty, ordered liberty. There's always a question about the needs of the state coincident with the needs of the religious believer. And so, uh, there is, I, I said this to John before we started, my greatest fear right now is I believe that we have entered the era of narcissism in which we have persuaded ourselves that somehow each of us lives in our own little religious bubble. And we shouldn't have to either touch another religious believer or accommodate them. And so if I am a corporate owner, I shouldn't have to have a health care plan that accommodates the religious beliefs of the employees because of my religious beliefs. This is an era of narcissism, and that is not what the framers had in mind. So what I thought I'd do is go through the three leading Supreme Court cases which make it very clear that narcissism is not religious liberty. It is licentiousness. In fact, we are called by the Constitution to both honor our own religious faith but at the same time, not to expect to be able to impose our religious faith on others around us. So the first case would be Thornton v. Calder. This is a case in which the government instituted a law that said that everyone who wants to can choose any Sabbath day they want of the week. As you can imagine, employers went ape, right? Their employees were saying to them, I'm taking Tuesday, I'm taking Saturday, or all of them were saying, I'm taking Sunday in a business that couldn't be shut down. And what the Supreme Court held is that it's unconstitutional for the government to impose on third parties the ad hoc and arbitrary religious beliefs of the employees. So no employee has a constitutional right to say to an employer, by the way, I won't show up on my Sabbath. 
that kind of arbitrary uh, and delegated government power to a private individual is unconstitutional. The next one is United States v. Lee. This is the case in which the Amish farmer argued that he should not have to pay Social Security taxes because he does not believe that the government should provide for the elderly. They provide for the elderly. So the government was getting in the way of the way in which they communally take care of the elderly. And the answer by the court was, no, you do not get out from under the obligation of Social Security. Why? One, because individualized exemptions for each individual who has some objection to uh, the tax laws makes it un infeasible and unworkable. You cannot impose your religious views on outsiders. Um, but in addition, and I think this is what's so critical and has been left out of the public debate about the um, uh, uh, preventive medical care for women. I'm not going to call it contraception. There are too many women that take the pill for purposes of medical purposes. I'm going to call it uh, preventive medical care. Uh, what the court said is the following. When believers enter into commercial activity by choice, the limits they accept are not to be superimposed on the system by them. Let me say that again. When believers enter into commercial activity by choice, the limits they accept are not to be superimposed on the system. So there was a choice as to whether or not Hobby Lobby would decide to be a for-profit business in the public square. That's clear. But what United States v. Lee says is that having chosen to be a commercial entity, they do not have the religious liberty rights that it then impose their religious viewpoint on their workers or on the rest of society. But finally, and most recently, is Hosanna Tabor. This is a case in which the Supreme Court said that religious entities have a constitutional right to engage in invidious discrimination based on race and gender and disability against their ministers. That's what, the, that's what that case is all about. Do ministers have rights under the federal civil rights laws against religious entities? The court said no. The First Amendment protects that religious entity so that it can exercise its religious right <coughs> to discriminate on the basis of race or gender or disability. What the court said at the end, though, is that this is a very narrow decision. We are not saying that a minister who's not been paid can't file a contract dispute. They can. We are not saying that tortious behavior by a religious entity is now immune from litigation. Right? Now, the reason they added that one is because I filed an amicus brief in which I said, please do not affect the child sex abuse cases. This is not about child sex abuse. This is about the relationship between the minister and the church, not about what third parties have been harmed by the church. And so the court's been very clear that, in fact, Religious belief in the United States, liberty, freedom, whatever you want to call it, does not include a right to have a universe that reflects your religious beliefs. Instead, we're stuck with a universe of diversity in which we must learn to operate it within the diversity instead of in a balkanized world where everybody has to agree or they can't even talk to each other. So finally, what, what is the key to success for a liberal democracy? And I, I do think the United States has done a better job on these issues than any country in the world in history. But I think it's not the free exercise clause that was so innovative. It was the establishment clause. The concept that the government and the church may not unite in power against the people is a radical move that is yet to be adopted by many other countries in the world. It's that move that has provided for the space for our extraordinary diversity, but also has created the less likelihood than any other country in history with our diversity of religious wars. We haven't had a religious war between competing religions as so much of the rest of the world has. I put that at the foot of disestablishment, of the decision that you can't trust religion and the state when they band together because that united power is what has been most oppressive in history. So, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Lilla. 
Uh, well, I, I'd like to uh, try to tie things together with uh, some things that were said this morning. And I'd like to take the question, and I don't remember the exact wording. Uh, the, the question has two parts, interestingly, here. One is, roughly, whether in order to be a liberal democracy, uh, a society has to guarantee religious freedom. The other was, in order to be long-lasting and durable, must it defend religious liberty? I want to submit that only the second question is interesting. There's a pathology in poli pol academic political theory today. You could say it's endemic to modern political thought from a certain point, but I'll just say since the great dispensation of Professor Rawls <laughs> that uh, political theorists are only interested in plan A. And who can build a better plan A? Do people have to come to the, the, the table using, uh, using vocabulary that we recognize as appealing to the other people? It all becomes very genteel. And this word reasonable gets thrown around all the time. It's, you, go to, you go to Princeton and you can't go to the cafeteria without everyone talking about whether you're being reasonable and asking for the ketchup. Um, and it's humbug. It's nothing but humbug. Where are the interesting and important religious problems in the world today? To begin with, they're not in the United States. They're elsewhere. As a gentleman here mentioned this morning, I thought he was absolutely right about that. But we have a problem in talking about uh, uh, religious liberty generally when we bring in the rest of the world. See, even to use the, the, the vocabulary of liberal democracy and religion, when in fact we're talking about Christian sects in the United States in the 20th century. Let's be honest about that. What I like about the project they're doing here at Georgetown is that they're disaggregating the, uh, their investigations into religious freedom by looking at different religions separately first before trying to generalize uh, about them. We also are afraid to talk about the one area of the world where this question is so crucial and that's the Muslim world. Instead, we want to talk about religion in general. We, don't, we have problems here, but given the problems in the world around this question of, of religious rights and religious toleration, this is small change. But at the level of, if I can say, put it that way, world history, 21st century history, the big questions are out there. What does academic political theory have to con contribute to that? Nothing. Why? Because plan A ain't happening. Not in our lifetimes, not in the lifetime of our children, not in the lifetimes of our grandchildren. So what's plan B? Political theory has nothing to say about plan B. Not interested. The great Aristotelian tradition of doing an analysis of the variety of regimes and the distinction between good and bad regimes and the third part of it how to make bad regimes of a certain type into slightly better versions of the type, we don't talk about that anymore. We're unable of talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, that's a project for the future of political theory. I hope to write about that someday. Um, so what happens? Uh, well, I was once in a public debate about, uh, about religion and politics with Christopher Hitchens and uh, also Noah Feldman. And uh, at a certain point, he was talking as if uh, Noah and I were opposed to liberal democracy if we had some complicated thoughts about what might be done and uh, what was going on in the Islamic world. And I said to Christopher, I said, we agree on plan A. If I could flip a switch and we could have liberal democracies with religious toleration throughout the world, tomorrow I would flip the switch. Not going to happen. What's plan B? His response was civilizational war. And that is the kind of thinking that we're in. If we don't have liberal democracy, c'est le déluge. If we don't have complete religious liberty guaranteed in a constitution for everybody, individual rights, c'est le déluge. It's not practical and it's not philosophically serious. You have to begin with the phenomena you have out there. And I would like us to start thinking about plans B, C, D, through Z. 
How does one begin doing that? Well, interestingly, the conversation this morning touched a little bit on that when Nick talked about the distinction between civil rights and natural rights. And he very helpfully pointed out that natural rights don't exist until they're positivized into a particular civil right. They only exist in the world as a civil right that appeals to uh, a natural right. But it's not the case, it doesn't follow from that, that every civil right must have a natural right lurking behind it. We can have a right that, that if, if you've contributed to Social Security and you've done your obligation, you have a right to get a payment. There's nothing in natural law about that. That's a civil matter. Now, what if we were to start thinking again about uh, religious rights in terms of civil rights and not in terms of natural rights? as things that can be negotiated, that are not absolute, that are not a big break against the power of the state and to turn every problem at, into that problem. Every problem is not that problem. Lots of these are small problems or things that can be negotiated. If I can move from a society where three religious groups are killing each other to a society where two of them are at peace and they don't want the other people around, they don't have a right to religion, that's an improvement. To have two groups that tolerate each other, that's an improvement. And it gets people to start practicing toleration. Don't let the best be the enemy of the good. The good is important. I'm all for the good. The best will take care of itself. Um, and so we can make small steps in thinking about um, not, and, and by make it, uh, having people make the case, for example, not that in order to be a liberal democracy, which is not going to happen here, you have to guarantee complete religious, you have to guarantee uh, religious liberty in a, in a broad sense, which is not going to happen either. Instead, we can say, we can try to make the pragmatic case that you will have a stable society if you uh, have a principle of toleration. So that if the rulers of that country are oligarchs, more people are living under oligarchy, in increasing numbers of people are living in oligarchy around the world right now. If you have a tyrant, don't you want to persuade the tyrant to, um, uh, 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 to impose, in this case, uh, religious toleration in his society, or for the oligarchs, or to see that there's an advantage, even for them to maintain control of their societies as oligarchs and tyrants? Yes, you do. That was Aristotle's point about tyranny. The best way to persuade a tyrant to be just is to persuade him that the only way he can hold on to his tyranny is to be just, at which point he becomes just, right? And what, whether he's a tyrant anymore is a definitional question. I think we lower the level of conversation uh, about these things and to think about limited religious freedom in places as an improvement. What might be workable? Because all these societies are different. Sometimes you have you know, a large number of religious faiths, and generally that's easier to impose, to, to have a, a regime of toleration there, than if you have two. Um, and, or you have two, and then you have another one that's, that's more ethnically based. So, the pro, so if you were able to establish in a regime, uh, in, in, in an Arab Muslim regime, a kind of peace, an entente, between the Shia and uh, the Sunnah, uh, but they still had trouble with the Alawites, or they had trouble with the Sufis or the Zoroastrianisms. They did not have the same religious rights as the Muslims. To me, that's an improvement. But we can think systematically about improvement. We can think systematically about, about, pragmatic, about the range of pragmatic, pragmatic choices before us. And that's the challenge, I think, uh, for thinking about these problems in, in our century. Great, sir. Uh, Professor Rienzi. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you to Tom and to, uh, to uh, Tim Shaw for inviting me here. Um, I, I also want to start with an apology like John, because I'd rather hear more, more from Mark Lilla than from Mark Rienzi right now, because uh, his, his discussion was uh, very interesting. And I, I'm going to bring it back to uh, more questions of, of American religious liberty law, which is, which is honestly what I know better, uh, although I hope to hear more uh, discussion of the international stuff from Mark as we go on. Um, I want to focus on the word liberal in the question about liberal democracies and religious freedom. Uh, because I think having robust protection for religious freedom um, is really an inherent part of being a liberal 
democracy, a liberal society that is tolerant of differences among its citizens. Um, so a, as a starting point, I would say that free and diverse people, uh, generally speaking, have a right both to come to their own conclusions about a transcendent reality and a god or gods or the lack thereof. Um, they have a right to make those conclusions. Uh, and within broad limits, they ought to have the ability to live their lives and order their institutions around those beliefs. In other words, they also ought to have the right to act as if they really believe what they believe. And I think part of living in a pluralistic and diverse society is accepting the fact that your neighbors won't always share your views. Your neighbors will be of different races from you and of different religions and of different sexual orientations. Uh, and that part of being in a liberal, diverse, pluralistic society is accepting that fact and accepting that the person down the street isn't going to live his or her life the same way you do. To me, that leads to uh, a pretty, pretty straightforward answer on religious liberty questions, which is unless the government has a particularly compelling reason to do so, <coughs> in a liberal, pluralistic society, it ought not be in the business of forcing people to violate or give up their religious beliefs. That part of being in a diverse society is that most of the time, the government really shouldn't force people to violate their religion as a condition of, of citizenship or uh, participation in the marketplace or anything else. Um, there will certainly be exceptions. Uh, as Marcy very correctly said, uh, the religious freedom right is, is not an absolute right. It is subject to limitations. But I think those limitations, uh, when properly set, um, give people pretty broad freedom to order their lives and their institutions uh, as they see fit. Um, I think Congress got that, uh, that uh, limit set properly uh, in 1993 in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act when it said as a matter of federal law that the government cannot substantially burden anyone's religion unless it has a compelling reason to do so and has used the least restrictive means to do it. Um, that leaves room for the government to infringe on someone's religion. For example, you know, the easiest example, your religion requires child sacrifice, fine. You're going to lose that claim, right? Government easily has a compelling interest in making you give up that religious practice. But most of the time, the government ought to, in order to be liberal, and in order to respect the fact that this is a diverse country, allow people to live according to their beliefs. So what does that mean in practice? Uh, to take the, the oldest historical example, um, a Quaker who doesn't want to fight in the military, uh, generally speaking, we ought to be willing to work around that religious objection, right? That person says, look, my God tells me I can't do that. Um, this is a diverse country. There are a lot of problems we have to solve. We can probably find a way to ask that Quaker to do something else that the Quaker can do. A Muslim or a Jewish or a Seventh-day Adventist doctor uh, or pharmacist who says, look, I can work six days a week, but there's a Sabbath that I cannot work on. Um, you know, theoretically, would the world be better if we could get seven days out of that person? Might they give out more health care? Sure. I um, mean, could you imagine a place that says, look, all doctors got to work every day? Um, it's theoretically possible. But in a, in a liberal and diverse place, I think the right answer to that is to say, look, if you want to come in and do good health care six days out of seven, God bless you. You know, go, go do it. Go do what you want on your Sabbath day. Uh, it's a diverse country. We don't all agree. We don't all live the same way. But we'll, we'll take you as you are. Um, same thing for a Catholic worker at a corrections institution or a Catholic juror or, or any other uh, juror who opposes the death penalty for that matter. Someone says, I can't participate in an execution. Um, executions are legal, uh, unfortunately, in some places. But generally speaking, we work around that religious objection. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's the mark of a liberal and tolerant society. Um, I think the opposite path, the opposite path in which we live in a world of government-enforced conformity um, a world in which you step your, you, you go to work for the corrections department, too bad, pal. You know, you came to work at a jail, you gave it up. Um, or you work in a regulated profession, you're, you're, a, you're a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist, too bad, you've got to leave that piece of yourself behind. Um, I don't think that's a very liberal society. I don't think that's a very tolerant society. I think in the vast majority of situations, we can work around religious objections very, very easily. Um, two examples of that. One, uh, how many years ago now? Eight years ago, um, there was the beginning of a big controversy over whether pharmacies and pharmacists should be forced to sell emergency contraception. Um, and there was litigation for a long time in Illinois, which ended last year. Litigation still ongoing from Washington State over that. Um, in both cases, the cases went on for six or seven years. 
And at the end of those cases, when the states were actually forced to put on proof of the problem, proof of the harm, um, they ended up having to admit that they had no evidence that the religious objection of the small handful of pharmacists who said, you know what, I can give out all the other drugs, but that one, my religion doesn't let me do. <coughs> they ended up having to admit that they had no evidence that that religious objection had ever harmed anybody. Um, and if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, one of these pharmacies was in downtown Chicago, right? There's really no need to say that every single pharmacist in Chicago must sell every single drug, right? Generally speaking, we don't require every pharmacist to sell every cancer drug, every AIDS drug, or any other, other kind of drug. And where there are needs to get these drugs to people, usually I think the answer ought to be that it ought to be the willing people. It ought to be the willing institutions. If the government believes it's really important, it ought to be the government doing it. But that it shouldn't be that we say to people, you're not welcome here even if you can provide 99% of the services uh, because that particular stance, you've, you've set foot in a regulated world, you've set foot in a world where you make money, therefore you can't have that. Um, the result, by the way, in Illinois was that some pharmacies closed and some pharmacists left the state at a time when the state actually had a shortage of pharmacies and pharmacists. Um, I don't think it was actually good for healthcare in Illinois that Governor Bogoyevich tried to force this for six or seven years on the state. It, it was actually bad. The world is actually better with a pharmacist who can give out 99.5% of the drugs than making that pharmacist shut his doors and leave the state. Uh, nobody wins that way. And I think in a liberal, tolerant society, we ought to be able to say uh, we can live without forcing everybody to do every last thing. And if we really see a problem, then the government or willing people ought to step in to do it. But it shouldn't be the, the firm hand of government saying there's an enforced orthodoxy here and everybody has to do it. Um, and, I, and I do think that also holds for people who make money. Um, so I do think if you go into business, you haven't given up your right to have a conscience. And if you're a drug maker, I think that gives you the right to say, you know what, I don't want to sell drugs that are going to be used in capital punishment. And if you're Chipotle, I think it gives you the right to say, I don't want to partner with the Boy Scouts because I don't like their stance on, on gay scout masters. And I think if you're Hobby Lobby, it also gives you the right to say, there are things I can't pay for, and there's a small list of things that I can't pay for. Um, in a world where we have health exchanges, you know, the computer says they're not working, but eventually, I assume they'll be working, right? Government has set up all these healthcare exchanges. Why in a tolerant society can't the answer be, if you don't like the health plan that Hobby Lobby offers, here, the government will give it to you through the exchanges, right? Why can't the answer be other ways of providing things instead of saying to everybody, in this society, you have to fit the party line, you have to do exactly what we say, and there's no room for differences. Um, to me, a liberal society shouldn't do that. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much to uh, our wonderful panelists for uh, four excellent um, presentations. The first question that I would like to ask is, uh, why are we even having this conversation about religion? I mean, I think of uh, Admiral Stockdale saying this quip at the beginning of a vice presidential debate, who am I and why am I here? Um, <laughs> what, what, what I mean by that is to say, why is religion's impact on liberal democracy controversial? After all, one does not see uh, similar controversies on whether, say, economic or scientific knowledge or certain moral theories generally belong in uh, democracy. I mean, to borrow an example from uh, Nick Walterstorff, you know, one doesn't see, for instance, Kantians debating whether, you know, utilitarians ought to be able to speak in utilitarian terms in democracy, even though they vehemently, vehemently degree, disagree with utilitarians. They don't say, well, that kind of claim shouldn't be a part of democracy. Well, what is it about religion that breeds controversy and that rightly, um, or perhaps rightly, um, you know, gives us pause or reasons why there maybe ought to be controversy. Let me begin with um, John Diulio. Now, you said um, that you think you, that you said something like, it sounded like a theological claim when you said, hell yes, or what the hell. That, that sounded theological. But despite I, had, your, I was going yeah. to put it differently, but we yeah. are at yeah. a PG or G-rated Catholic <laughs> university show. Well, if that was PG, okay, I'd yeah, hate to hear yeah, it. No. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. But um, it, it, uh, nevertheless, you said that um, because you're surrounded by citizens with different yeah. religious beliefs, then you uh, therefore adopt a common language. But we wouldn't say that if, uh, say, we were talking about economics. I mean, say, for yeah. instance, I, I'm a Keynesian. Now, I went, I'm surrounded by libertarians. I'm surrounded by socialists. I'm surrounded by uh, supply-siders. I'm surrounded by uh, distributivists. But I wouldn't say, well, I should somehow find a neutral language or anything. No, I just enter the debate. 
So, so why is it different well, with religion? Well, yes. first of all, if you're an economist, God help you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Thankfully, I'm not. Because yes. you have a theology, not a science. <laughs> but let me put that aside if I haven't offended any of our fellow economists here. But um, look, the, uh, let me answer the question by going back to Madison. Madison thought it was very problematical. And if you go back to Federalist Paper Number 10, after he talks about how the tendency to faction is sown in human nature, the very first source of faction he mentions is, quote, a zeal for different opinions concerning religion, close quote. Why? Because he understood, with Thomas Jefferson on the left bank of his opinion, and John Witherspoon, Reverend Witherspoon, on the right bank of his opinion, Madison understood that no faith is beyond faction. He understood that religion can be a tremendous social tonic, as well as an incredibly toxic force, and so it was going to be a balancing act. Religion, as the Supreme Court put it, I guess, and there are experts here, I don't know if it was, the, I think it was the Lock v. Davy case, where the court said, religion is of a different ilk, and so it is, which is why we separate it out for special burdens and special benefits, uh, alas, and why we're always talking about negotiations and plan Bs and accommodations at the end of the day. So I think, it's, I think it's, it goes back to the, to the founding period. But I also think we're talking about it now in this context today because it has become, and I take Marcy's point, the, the narcissism or however you want to put it or the unwillingness for people to sort of look for a plan B or to negotiate, we're at a period where we could have a debate where one side says you're waging a war against women and the other side says you're waging a war against religion and where the one side that makes the first claim can ignore the fact that a lot of the people who are making that argument and representing the values that are at stake there are themselves women who have been leaders in women's rights movements and so forth, and where the other side that says you're waging a war against religion can ignore the fact that some of the people saying that have received three, four billion dollars in grants from government within the last year, which is the kind of war I'd like to have waged uh, on me. So we're at a period where people are not for, for a variety of reasons, are not really listening to each other and not focusing in common on the kinds of accommodations, the kinds of plan Bs or Cs or Ds that I think in other periods in recent history, we were much better able uh, to find sort of that, that common ground. Yeah. Yeah. But if I could just press you a little bit further, is it something distinctive about religion which makes this difficult? After all, um, I mean, our government is shut down right now. It doesn't look like a religious debate, but that's pretty pretty divisive as well. Maybe religion is behind oh. it in some ways, but yeah. but, uh, but but it's not directly well, about religion. You gotta, well, I mean, it's, uh, aren't there fierce debates on, on I, secular I, grounds I could as get, well? Yeah, there are fierce debates among Kantians and utilitarians that are right, you know, all over the country uh, right now. Uh, no, but I mean, no, you got. I see a few got, in the audience. I mean, that's... look, you got 350,000 plus churches, synagogues, and mosques in this country, and other houses of worship. It's it's a two trillion dollar a year tax exempt sector. More than half of those revenues are going into religious institutions. There are people of different faiths who represent their respective faiths in the public square in all sorts of ways, sometimes in ways that are egregious, and sometimes that are ways that are quite uh, you know productive of cooperation and comity. It's on every corner. There are more religious institutions than there are gas stations uh, in many places. So it's pervasive. You watch a football game, and they don't, I don't know there's the praying halfback as much as they used to have. But, you know, I mean, religion is integral to the American. You know, what's God got to do with the American experience? Everything. And then where do we go from here is the question. So I would say at one level, you know, sort of empirically, historically speaking, it's everywhere one looks. And it's unlike anything else. And when we start to disagree about it, as we've done recently, and when we can't find accommodation, Katie, bar the door. Okay. Maybe let's uh, see you nodding your head, uh, Professor <laughs> Hamilton, and uh, I wanted to ask you a similar question because your um, uh, presentation seemed to be largely cautionary about religion. I heard you loud and clear at the beginning when you said, yes, there's a right to religious liberty, and, uh, but the, the thrust of the uh, court cases you gave and your comment about an era of narcissism and so forth, it seems to me your worries are on the side of religious claims kind of uh, g going berserk. So again, for you, what would you say it is, what is it about this phenomenon of religion that uh, is worrying? It's, it's the fact that religion claims truth, which can't be proven. And so, uh, and anybody who thinks they have special access to the truth uh, it has kind of, you know, I mean, we call it self-righteousness, you can call it what you want, but it's not that I am uh, anti-religion, but I am extremely like the framers, distrustful of humans. And, you know, it, but, but for humans, religion would be perfect. But 
The human part of it is disastrous in many, many circumstances. And, and I would, I, I love Mark's comments, but I really would take exception uh, with the concept that we wouldn't be focusing on the United States for difficult and horrific religious liberty issues that are on par with the rest of the world. I'm constantly railing against Hollywood because they're gonna save the rest of the world and leave the children here suffering. We have serious sex abuse of children in a wide array of religious groups from the most respected to the most problematic. We have religious groups in the United States that don't feed babies anything but lettuce and they let them die, right? We have religions that use the oppression of women as the basic structure of the religious organization. So we have horrific, difficult, very hard questions involving religious liberty in the United States. And I think that the out is in, uh, as this has been echoed several times today, the concept of a shared human rights worldwide uh, is part of what we need uh, as a touchstone for judging when religious conduct has gone too far. Mm -hmm. so. but, but these kinds of uh, sex abuse cases and so forth, aren't these things that you know, we all see as uh, kind of off the reservation? I mean, isn't, there, um, isn't that kind of an already established limits? I mean, where do you think, where do you think the problem is conceptually? I, obviously, these things are horrible, right. but, where, but you seem to think that there's a problem in the law or the no, way no, that no. we're approaching it. No, them. there's not a problem in the law. There's a problem in religion. Uh, and the problem in religion is that there has been a set of theological principles that stand for the proposition that you can't let the, the world see the bad behavior inside the religious organization. So in the Catholic tradition, it's the rule against scandal. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, it's, it's exactly the same rule. Uh, the Latter-day Saints have exactly the same rule. And when you have an organization that believes that you must appear as holy on the outside as you believe that your religion is on the inside, and therefore you can't let the crime out. You victimize women and children. And so we have a systemic problem in the United States with a sense that religion is always good. It, I, I call it in God versus the gavel, the Sunday school version of religion, where it's always good, the teacher's always nice, you get stale cookies and warm lemonade, right? That's religion in the United States. That's the religion I heard talked about earlier today. What I'm talking about is religion on the ground, the way it operates. And when you know the way it actually operates, uh, we have human rights violations across the board, and we have very, very serious problems. So we need to talk about religious freedom for religions, not religious freedom for the religions that all behave well and all believe in a transcendent reality we all like. That's just not what we have. We have over 100,000 sects of religious groups in the United States. But just a question, question on the distinctiveness, what you're saying about the large organization and not wanting to let it out. I mean, it strikes me that the same could be said for, say, business corporations. I mean, this happens all the time. That's Something my scandalous point. happens in, but, but then is it dis anything distinctive about religion anymore? Well, what, what's- Governments, right? That happens all well, the time there too, doesn't it? What I, would, what I would compare, actually, is the way in which Penn State has handled their sex abuse crisis in comparison to my own institution, YU, the Yeshiva University, which has had a sex crisis as well, which is, is tragic. YU, and thank God for tenure, but YU has completely failed, completely failed, and for all the same reasons that the Catholic Church has so far failed on these issues. And it's because of a sense that the institution is so important that you don't really need to worry about the little guy, the little kid, uh, who's been sexually abused. And so the Penn State, accountable to the public, hires Louis Free, outsider, names names, gives you dates, says they're guilty. We're now sending uh, the leaders to court, right? Spaniard, I mean, it's unbelievable. What bishop has been uh, sent to court for covering up child sex abuse? We haven't seen it. And so uh, I, I, would, I would posit that the uh, secular institution that's been the biggest focus on these issues has done a far better job than any religious institution so far. And I think partly it's because of the shield of religious liberty. And frankly, it's the combined demand for something that they call church autonomy, which doesn't exist. It's not in the law. Supreme Court's never used the term. But the Latter-day Saints, the Catholic Church, 
have united in arguing for church autonomy. The notion that you're autonomous from the community means that you can betray the vulnerable and not do the right thing. So I think religious liberty has in many ways tempted religious organizations into a position that's absolutely dangerous to the public. And, and by the way, I'm religious, so. I'm Presbyterian, my husband's Catholic, goes every week. They don't a like him, but he amen, goes every week. Amen, sister. So, Professor Rienzi, uh, your name has been invoked. Uh, where do you come in on these issues? Which ones? Oh, well, uh, I was, I was going to say the one Choose where your name was invoked, but I forgot which one it was. Um, what, so you're, the, you're in the field of, of relig religion and law. Why is there a field? Well, what is it about religion that requires some, you know, all these balances and, and so forth? Is there something distinctive about religion that creates issues and problems? Well, you know, I think, yes, there's something distinctive about religion. It goes back to what, what John said earlier and what, and what Marcy said earlier, too, right? John said, James Madison said, the, you know, the, one of the things that provokes, you know, serious disagreement of opinion is religion, right? And religion gets treated differently, um, again, in some ways positive and in some ways negative by the Constitution. Uh, but I think historically we've had an understanding that religion is different, um, that some of that can be good, some of that can yield very, very bad behavior. Um, so I think that's true. And I think finding the right, uh, the right balance is an important thing. Um, so you know, I agree with the idea that religious liberty uh, needs to be considered not simply by looking at good actors, but also by looking at bad actors. Uh, but to me, that's why you have something like a compelling interest test, so that you say, no, it's not that religions always get to do exactly what they want whenever they want, um, that there are some limits on that. And where uh, the government has a compelling interest, it's allowed to override that. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way it's been for a very long time. And it seems to me that that's um, a good way to, to run the system. Why is it a bigger issue now? You know, I think one of the reasons it's a bigger issue now is the whole controversy over the HHS mandate that sort of elevated it to you know, a big national fight. Um, I don't think that's actually good for religious liberty at all. I think it'd be better um, if it wasn't a front page battle. I think it'd be better if it didn't turn into a partisan war. Um, but I think as a factual matter, that's just where it is. Mm -hmm. Professor Lilla, if you don't mind, I'm going to depart a little bit. I, w I would like to invoke one of your previous writings. And the reason is because I think I it... when people do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason is because I think it comes right in the middle of, of this question about re religion, whether there's something distinct about it that creates a problem for liberal democracy. So in The Stillborn God, you made a very striking claim that historically, it was precisely when political philosophy um, stopped thinking in the kind of categories of political theology that liberal democracy became a possibility in the West, or at least that was the historical trajectory here. Maybe it's not necessary that you made that claim, but in our history, that's, that's the way it happened. What was it about religion which got in the way and which had to be kind of broken free of? Uh, well, I, uh, just tell me what you think the conflict is. Otherwise, I'm going to have to I, I want to know if I have to apologize for my previous book the way John had to <laughs> apologize. A lot of for apologizing his pre previous, going on here. Uh, appearance. I, I think that um, the, the question is it seems to, your argument seems to presuppose that there was something about religion that got in the way of the possibility of democracy, such that we, when it was broken free of, then this new possibility came into being but with Hobbes. Well, no. What got in the way, I, I don't use the word religion in the book. Political theology. Theology. Mm -hmm. okay. Theology is a way of thinking. It's a systematic mm. way of thinking about life, existence, what's beyond, and what's here. It's not the practice of religion. We've always had the practice of religion. There's been different ways of regulating it, of it you know, being under the, as the basis of the state or not. I was talking about theology. And the shift I talked about in the book is between political theology, where you begin with a theological presupposition and work from there, uh, Contrast that to political anthropology, which is you begin with an analysis of human nature. And it was on the basis of an analysis of human nature, which you can contest with Machiavelli and Hobbes and all the rest. You could say they had a wrong picture of human nature, and, uh, but, and which is what Rousseau said and what Kant said and so on. And so we got a trajectory that, that provided a space where something like liberal democracy could grow. There's nothing necessary about that. Um, but it was focused on um, the harm that people can do to each other. Yeah, and, and sort of, now you may say that's setting the bar too low, that we need to talk about how humans can best flourish and all the rest. That would be another kind of political anthropology one could talk about. It would not be a political theory. 
Um, but again, I don't know what that has to do with this discussion here. Well, but it goes back to the idea that um, political theology was creating a problem so that, uh, in a sense, had to be broken free of for democracy to become possible. Such that if you, uh, that would seem to indicate if you had a kind of a return to the strength of political theology in our society, that would threaten democracy. And I think in one of your, I think in your New York Times article, you were arguing some, something with that kind of wordy in mind, and that also gets into your invocation of Islam, where. Yeah, well, what it does is it takes your eye off the ball, and that is human, in, uh, human nature and, and understanding that. But essentially, I take political theology uh, to always presuppose at some point a revelation <clears throat> uh, that is not open to, rash, to, to, to refutation, is taken as the presupposition. Um, now, you might be able to build a very good regime on the basis of that. It's possible. But it's a high-risk it's a high-risk exercise. What, what I was arguing separated, let's say, political Islam today from uh, uh, liberal democratic discourse was that the separation was that they, they made different appeals. And you could point to you know, a, a good liberal democracy and a bad liberal democracy, and you can imagine a good political theology. There's no good example for us right now or, or, or a bad one. But I wanted to make a distinction between, not, not religion, but uh, the kind of discourses that go on and why uh, conversation is actually not really possible, hmm. uh, fundamentally, fundamentally. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk practically about what we might do, but we really are on two banks of a river. Is it necessary? What if somebody were appealing to theology for their political beliefs? but nevertheless had a posture of trying to find common ground with people of different theologies. So they're not leaving their theology in any way, but, but they're trying to, um, but nevertheless, they're, they're adopting a posture sure. of um, capaciousness. C couldn't that be possible? Listen. Oh yeah, but that doesn't mean that the regime, the principle of the regime is not theological, mm -hmm. but rather uh, people have their own theological reasons for being for policy X mm -hmm. rather than policy Y, and that's perfectly legitimate as long as they obey the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are not based on a revelation. OK. Well, let me, um, let me move to one other question. And then I, then I think we can have uh, questions from the audience. I'd like to move away a little bit from the kind of um, you know, arguments about theology and the content of religious claims, but look more at the um, habits and virtues of religion um, as, as a subject of conversation and their relationship to democracy. Um, Going back to at least to uh, Tocqueville, we have the idea that religion, in some sense, funds democracy through the kind of habits and um, uh, kind of practices, to invoke Reverend Thistlethwaite was talking about practices, that, that it involves. So things like assembly, things like um, uh, maybe a sense of restraint that it breeds, maybe a sense of participation, you know, getting people out to work in the soup kitchens and what have you. Or maybe even theologically, but in a generalized sense, that it gives people a sense of, if you believe in a transcendent God, maybe that's a, those people tend to favor more the limits of government. So maybe there's some you know, really good practices and virtues that um, religion gives democracy. On the other hand, um, we are say from Professor Hamilton, worries about some of the practices of religion, things like closure and non-transparency and so forth and so on. Let's start with Professor Diulio, because you, in your work and in your talk, talk, talk about religion as civil society. Um, by and large, is, is religion, does religion kind of fund the health of liberal democratic society in some crucial ways, or how, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's important to remember that we've got a district, you know, when you're talking about something as large as, you know, religious organizations, religious nonprofits, of which there are literally hundreds of thousands, and uh, millions of people who are involved in the employee as volunteers, you're going to get quite a variety of outcomes and quite a variety of behaviors. In the main, if you uh, believe uh, people like uh, my old friend and teacher Bob Putnam at Harvard, who's looked pretty carefully uh, at this, uh, both in his early work with the uh, Saguaro Seminar and his uh, recent book with David Campbell of Notre Dame, mm -hmm. uh, American Grace, uh, he believes that uh, almost any way you measure it, religion variously measured, is the main repository of social capital in America. So if you take houses of worship and other religious organizations out of the mix, if you take religious volunteers out of the mix, uh, you're not going to see the kind of 
you know, predominantly pro-social and pro-civic outcomes that are associated with this. And by the way, it's, it is indeed food pantries and homeless shelters and all the traditional things, but part of the reason we're having this discussion and we have the debates we do is that religious organizations, for good or for ill, and I think it's a bit of both, are intimately engaged in the provision of all sorts of major uh, federal social programs and state programs. You can't do Medicaid ultimately without faith-based nursing homes. You can't do a lot of the major programs, so it's not some little tiny, teeny thing off to the side. Um, I think on net, obviously, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, I, I, I believe on net that religion is a very positive and pro-social force, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that need to be looked at within particular religious traditions and organizations. Uh, and furthermore, I think that it's a little too easy in this discourse and debate to sort of, you know, we can cherry pick our examples. And I don't think anyone on this panel, frankly, has done that. I think everybody is being open and honest here, and I think earlier today, and it, it, about the fact that we're looking at a, quite a variety of religious organizations, institutions, and behaviors. In the end, however, I would, I would put, put the question back to you this way. If I were to say to you that as a result of these very difficult public debates that we're having, that eventually enough religious people in the public square are going to feel obliged to withdraw. So hundreds of hospitals close, religious hospitals. Uh, a half of that third of daycare is no longer available. I think that's the kind of possibility that should concentrate both the mind and the heart. Not that everybody's going to, again, say, oh, well, it's fine. We, we know exactly where the common ground is. But to begin the search for accommodation and negotiation in a way that doesn't assume that everybody ultimately shares the same values or starts from the same premises, which obviously they don't. Can I jump in there? Yes. Yeah. Um, this lesson, <coughs> oddly, you know, I, I, I agree with John and always have, but uh, what really came home to me recently in the you know, past few years is I spent a month in China. And I was surprised by the fact that wherever I lectured and taught to students and taught, that um, they were very worried about the fact that with neoliberalism, as they call it and think about it, this, this kind of weird regime they've got that's politically autocratic, but um, all this economic activity is unregulated, uh, for which political theory and political science has no name, I point out, um, that, uh, that there was no longer a sense of, mor of moral obligation. They, they felt that that was uh, disappearing, that old people would be on the streets and no one would stop to help them. There'd be an accident, everyone would walk away. Now, the argument they would make is that um, under the communist regime, that uh, if uh, the reason you had to do something is because you were told to do something. There was never inculcated the idea, the very idea of obligation. It's not particular obligations, but the very idea that you have an obligation, that obligation is such, and that one of the, one of the real breaks with the communist regime from the 5,000-year uh, moral and political tradition that was based on obligation, not on rights, but on obligations. And that was not a question of belief. Um, Chinese religion is an orthopraxy. It's not an orthodoxy. Um, it, it, but th there, that uh, what a, a religious life can bring is, is the very idea of obligation. And the more we talk about rights and want to have to force everything into a conversation about rights and derive obligations from them, at the psychological level, we don't. We are. We find it difficult to train people, young people especially, to think that they have the, 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 that that they might have obligations, and um, so, so that's something that uh, religion in this country very much brings to the table mm -hmm. as a psychological force. But you're and you're worried, Professor Dulio, that the way that the law and policies are going, that that's choking off this way in which religion might bring some of this capital into the country. You know, as, uh, look. Uh, most of social capital is spiritual capital at some level. That doesn't make religion all good. Uh, and it certainly doesn't make all the opinions held by people who are self-identified as religious or strongly religious, uh, right. it doesn't make them right. We've reached a point in the public and civic discourse where we are at an impasse, and I think Marcy's exactly right. I think it's in part because it's not, it's, yes, it's the people in, you know, from various religious perches and perspectives, but it's also people who are taking perspective of, you know, we're representing other values here, 
And there's not, there's not a real, there's no real discussion. The discussion's happening here today. There's no real discussion going on. People are not reading each other's briefs. They're not reading each other. In, in the court of law, when it gets to that point, they may be. But they're not taking each other's arguments seriously. And they're not looking. I'm not saying there was once a golden age where everybody, the lion laid down with the lamb and the lamb got some sleep. I'm not saying that. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that I, in, my, in my adult lifetime, including having spent a couple of interesting years with uh, Stanley and others in Washington, I don't think I've ever seen such, such a discourse where people who I, and I know many of the people on each or all sides of this who I respect deeply, and I don't just say that you know, the way politicians, I really do. They're not, they're not talking, they're not listening to each other. They're not hearing each other, and they're losing sight of the common good that can be done if we accommodate each other at the margins a little bit. You know, you trust people differently if you know them better. You forgive things in a relationship you know, differently if you have what Millard Fuller of, of Habitat for Humanity called the theology of the hammer. Spend some time with sweat equity with people of different traditions, faith and no faith, and you're going to see them differently at the end of the day. That's what's, I think, largely, all, we're almost bereft of that now. That's my worry or concern. Very good. Let's open it up to the audience for some questions. Uh, yes, sir. Do we have an, uh, a microphone coming over? Okay. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Ilan Alon, and I'm an economist. Um, I'm, 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 very so <laughs> I'm very sorry to hear that, sir. I, uh, I can proselytize just later kidding. and convert you to... Uh, no, it's now it's your <laughs> turn to apologize. Yeah, now it's your turn to apologize. <laughs> You're brave to admit it. Uh, actually, I, uh, I wanted to, uh, to get to the core of the panel. And uh, when I, we started the panel and I looked at the title, I was hoping that I will get some... Um, Pathology, somebody actually used that term, understanding really why religious freedom impacts liberal democracies in a positive way. And what I got from everyone here is, yes, it impacts. Yeah, of course. And, and then I thought about the question. I said, of course. Uh, does liberty affect liberal democracies? Of course it does. It's, it's, isn't it tautological? Aren't we, can we say it the opposite way? It's exactly the same thing. So let me ask the question maybe in a different way. Are there conditions under which religious restrictions will result in positive political outcomes, such as political stability or lack of violence? And if so, what are those? And then I think we'll be in a better position to really look at the opposite conditions. I'd like to, to hear from your respective expertise. Well, that's easy. Sure. <laughs> uh, let's see, laws against <coughs> polygamy. Uh, which we saw the uh, uh, LDS church abandon when the law was going to be imposed on them. And, and by the way, I would take extreme exception to the history from this morning. The, the anti-polygamy law that was applied to the Mormons and, and the territories was the identical law that was already in place and applied to every state in the country and under common law in England. And so it was an extenuation, it was an extension of the law of uh, various states. It was not just all of a sudden, let's go after the, the, uh, the Mormons. Um, but th there are a whole series of laws. That the, uh, now, the UN recognizes that there's a human right against polygamy because it uh, destroys women and it destroys children. Uh, so there's an international human right against polygamy. Uh, the laws against child sex abuse dramatically limit religious organizations, not just the ones that are doing it uh, under, you know, undercover, but the ones that are doing it as part of their religious practices. So that would be Tony Alamo, uh, that would be uh, Children of God. I mean, there's a whole raft of religious organizations that engage in sex with children. Uh, the drug laws, I, I mean, we have many, many laws that restrict religious freedom uh, and but for RIFRA, which is one of the worst laws that's ever been passed in United States history, just to be clear on that, um, uh, we apply those laws and so that religion is forced into behavior that is good for the polity and that doesn't hurt other people. So we, ha we have a whole raft of laws that are applied to religious groups and uh, daily they're subjected to them. So, uh, so in, in some ways that's kind of an easy question in this country at least. Well, this is a natural cue, given that you positively invoked uh, RIFRA. Yeah, <laughs> he loves RIFRA. Well, I don't disagree with that, except for, except for the part about RIFRA. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I know. And, I, and I, would, it in there. And I would just say, going back to John's point about, you know, there not being a time where the lion and the lamb laid down together, there not being a golden age, 
Yeah, gosh, I'm not that old, but I think 1993, when you had 97 senators and President Clinton signing the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and President Clinton saying that um, that effort to essentially give religious individuals and groups freedom unless and until there's a gov compelling government interest because they're hurting somebody. Um, President Clinton signing that, 97 senators agreeing to that. I, I think that feels pretty golden age to me, and it feels like a time when most people could get together and say, we may disagree over abortion, we may disagree over uh, any number of things, but we ought to at least agree that people ought to be allowed to live according to their religions um, unless and until the government has a particularly strong reason for stopping them. Can I just yeah. ask, oh well, maybe we should go to the question. Uh, you want to get in here? Well, I, I, You're I, the I, one I wanted to point uh, to. Yeah. No, I just I was about to say that um, that actually does touch on, on my book, which is available on Amazon.com, where they take Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and PayPal. <laughs> Um, that uh, when you move from political theology to, to political anthropology, then the question is, it becomes the question of in what way can, it, 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 religion becomes in, uh, instrumentalized, right? The question is, what does it contribute to a good human life with no reference to God? What does it contribute to a good political life? In what ways can it hurt individuals? In what way can it hurt a society? But you're having that conversation, which is a reading of human nature, human religious creatures, rather than talking about what God wants. Can I just add one thing quickly? Religion has positive externalities right. uh, but, uh, on, on net. But one example I would use is, in, it's in the Clinton era, which I'm perfectly uh, prepared to agree was a golden era. Uh, uh, the 1996 Section 104 of the Welfare Reform Act was the so-called charitable choice provision of which Stanley Carlson Tees is a world's leading authority. And it specified mm -hmm. the conditions under which government could, could as well as was not to partner with religion in giving grants. And the first line of those restrictions was no proselytizing with public funds, in addition to no religious instruction, no sectarian worship with public funds. That proselytizing uh, prohibition may have struck most people as kind of, of course, settled law, but it did not strike uh, a number of people in the religious communities as unproblematical uh, at least four or five years later. And they wanted to challenge that uh, directly. I think that is a very positive thing to have as a, you know, no, as a non-negotiable condition of public-private partnerships involving religious nonprofit organizations. It's hard, it's hard to interpret and enforce, but it's, it's clearly, I think, a positive restriction on the role of religion in the public square. Okay, let's get some of these other uh, questioners. Um, Father Hollenbach. Just a question that I, well, not a question, an observation that I'd like to make. I mean, you've been talking about a, been talking about a number of the major dangers of religion in vis-a-vis -vis democracy. There's a, an argument that can be made about religion as a contributor to democracy that I don't think should be overlooked. Uh, Dan Philpott has worked on this in terms of the Catholic tradition. Uh, there was a reference to Sam Huntington this morning about the way after the Second Vatican Council, Roman Catholicism <coughs> contributed to a major movement toward <coughs> democracy in many countries around the world. And uh, you could go back and look at the role of uh, religion in, we'll bring up South Africa again, what happened with the overthrow of apartheid uh, with Desmond Tutu and any number of other religious organizations. So, I mean, there are, there are cases where it's not only the dangers of child sex abuse, but there's also the possibility of really the advancement of human rights uh, and a whole range of democratic and other human values that really need to be taken into account. So how we balance those things, it seems to me, becomes really an important question mm -hmm. in light of the overall issue that this panel is discussing. I'd like to hear ways in which panel members might want to talk about some of the positive contributions that might be made. Well, h historically, there's been a balance. Uh, I completely agree. And, there, and, and, and John is the king of uh, <laughs> public service by religious organizations, so I feel like I can't add anything mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. but, but I would always keep in mind the balance, because we have a tendency in the United States to be triumphalist about our religion, uh, which for, has theological roots. But anyway, um, uh, you know, I, I would never forget that religion justified slavery and religion freed us from slavery. 
So if you just remember that as the history, um, I, I think you just you stay on the straight and narrow. And I would also just say, in your international example, I actually gave a paper in, I think it was 1998, at the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, another organization which did not invite me back. Um, <laughs> uh, which, uh, hey, they didn't invite me the first time. They didn't invite you the first time. Which the paper was basically about this issue, and it was Sam Huntington, it was also Seymour Martin Lipset, it basically argued in, in unison that the religion in general and the Catholic Church in particular, the post-Vatican II Catholic Church, was the major force driving you know, the third wave of democratization around the world, right? Good news. <laughs> of course, the Catholic Church wasn't entirely on the side of liberal democracy uh, for most of its history. Yeah. Uh, not good news. Uh, so, so you know, there, there were changes. Um, and, and, uh, and there it is once again. It's, it's a balancing act. And the, and the only real question is, what, what is religion doing in the here and now? How is it doing it? And what are, the, what are the terms on which we bring religion into the public square? Understanding, as I've stressed over and over again, you can't do social service delivery in this country at any significant scale without it, whether you like it or not. How that change took place would be really an interesting dialogue between Christians and Muslims uh, about how Muslims change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Steve Macedo. Uh, just one small point. Does the, I mean, people have mentioned RIFRA and so on. It did seem to me that RIFRA in some ways was a kind of over... Well, someone tell me what RIFRA is? It's the Religious, oh, Religious Freedom, Freedom Restoration Act, Act passed oh, okay, specifically right. in response to the Smith case, right. which itself was <clears throat> extreme. So you have one extreme against another. Because Scalia says in Smith that uh, we're not going to strike down laws only because they only pose an incidental burden on religion. He goes back to the rule of Gobitis, which said it's okay to require children to salute the flag because it's a civic exercise. It doesn't have a religious purpose. So even though it burdens people's religion, well, that's tough. You know, Walter Burns has argued that way too. It's a kind of, it's on both sides, uh, people. But that's that's a very extreme opinion. Which and then RIFRA comes in, in, in a way. It depends on how you interpret the compelling state interest standard. But if it really has to be compelling state, least restrictive means, and so on, you're, you're it's in a way you got. Uh, with Scalia, a very strong presumption against religious burdens, and then with Riffer, at least it reads like a very strong. And what you really want is, I think John is right, some some more of a balancing. Now, Roberts has said, at least in one of these cases, that he interprets compelling state interests as meaning we're going to try to strike reasonable balances and so on. And that, that I think, is the There's way to go. There's that word again. There's <laughs> that word again. <laughs> yeah. I, I would actually but, take But it. I, I, I just think you've got two extremes going. And this, this, those two things kind of polarize things. And the fact that 96 senators and so on, I mean, the politics of it, uh, I'm sure, would have, would have been terrible. Like demagogue, who are you going to be against religious freedom? Because I remember, I actually looked at this up. There Dan, was a time when that Dan would have been a good Meyer, argument. I mean, Who would be William Danemeyer is saying things like it took Deng Xiaoping to bring Senator so and so Kennedy together and I on China policy. You know, it took Justice Scalia in the Riffer case to bring us together on religious freedom. I, I, I mean, who's going to be against religious freedom? Steve, I, I'm one of your biggest fans, but this is false history. Okay. Smith actually reflects. I was clerking at the court the year Smith was decided, and I got all of the justices' papers. Mm -hmm. Smith reflects the law as it stood. It's actually accurate. When he says it's the vast majority of cases that we have not applied strict scrutiny, it's true. That, that, that's a fact. RIFRA was an extraordinary overreaction in which religious organizations took a political moment and ran. Uh, the, the Senate did pass it, not unanimously, but 97. The House passed it by unanimous consent. You know, we know what that means. That means two people are in Washington. Um, it's a horrible procedure. It's the least accountable procedure in Washington. <laughs> What the, the pro, I took refer to the Supreme Court. They declared it unconstitutional across the board. It was reenacted to apply to federal law, and now only applies to federal law. Um, but it, it's really problematic. And, and the reason it's problematic, it's not the compelling interest test. I don't have any problems with saying the government has an important interest. They can articulate that. It's the least restrictive means requirement. This law says the government can't apply any law to a religious believer unless it's the least restrictive means for this religious believer. It is right down the path of narcissism. It is that the world will be recreated in the image of this one believer. Uh, and so I would actually attribute the start of our downhill trend to uh, the advent of RIFRA, but that, that's a completely other panel. Would you like to get in? And I would just really briefly say that we've lived under federal RIFRA for 20 years. 
and in 20-something states we have state versions of RIFRA. Uh, and if you leave aside the recent controversy over the HHS mandate where you know, I'm sure some people think the Hobby Lobby decision is right, some people think it's wrong. Uh, other than that, I would bet most people, A, don't notice, and B, can't name a situation in which they think, oh my goodness, this religious freedom right has overrun us. Uh, the fact of the matter is I think most people cross state <laughs> lines between RIFRA states and non-RIFRA states and never notice it because the truth is it actually doesn't overrun the rest of the law at all. Uh, never has. If it had, everyone would know about it already. See, Rabbi Saperstein yeah. is jumping. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Hello, Rabbi. Uh, Rabbi yes, Saperstein. Who's involved yes. in the enactment of RIFRA? I want to follow up on the same RIFRA question. Mark Rienzi, you uh, were fairly, and I don't know what the word is uh, here. I, it, w it was an easy formulation simply to say, you know, there's really no big problem. Uh, you know, most of these things can easily be accommodated. So I want to push yep. you. And then I'd love to hear Marcy's uh, reaction and the others as well. Uh, here, where do you draw the line? In other words, give us examples, and not the child uh, sacrifice examples. In real life, knowing some of the disputes coming on, where do you think compelling interests actually uh, come into play to restrain what religious groups can do? Um, Marcy suggested you know what, there's a difference when it's just the government and the individual, as opposed to when third parties are involved. Where do third party rights come into the way you see it? And uh, how do they get accommodated and balanced against this? I'd just like to hear a little more about exactly some of the big issues that we have and how you deal with them. Sure, um, a couple things. One, I think third party rights and interests come in in terms of um, they may amount to a compelling government interest to protect some third party interest. I don't think in the contraceptive case you get anywhere close to it, right? In the contraceptive case, there are a million other ways to get people these drugs without dragging the little sisters of the poor um, or these other organizations saying, you, you got to provide it, right? So I don't think the compelling interest gets anywhere close in cases like that. I think it's actually a laugher to, to call it a compelling interest. It's really not. There's a million other ways to do it. We actually already do it through Title X. Right? We give people free contraceptives all the time. We now have the exchanges. There's no compelling government reason in forcing religious people to do something they don't want to do. Um, what, what would look like a compelling interest? Um, a draft case. Right? In a draft case, I could actually imagine making a good argument there's a compelling interest to force somebody to violate their religious beliefs. Most of the time, we haven't decided that that's so. Most of the time, from a democratic point of view, we've decided to protect the religious objector. But I could certainly imagine a strong case there to say, OK, well, if this guy doesn't go to war, the next guy has to go. And that's, that's a real compelling interest for the government not to do that. Um, the example of, of a church where the parents only feed the babies lettuce. To me, easy example of a compelling interest. Kid's going to die if the kid doesn't get chemo. Um, easy example of a compelling government interest. Um, but the things we're fighting about these days, um, for the most part, I just don't think they come anywhere close. I think if you say, we want you to pay for somebody else's contraception, and therefore that's a compelling interest, if you say that, then everything is a compelling interest. And what you really have is a system in which the government can make you do whatever they want, whenever they want. And I don't think that's what Congress intended with RIFRA, um, and I don't, think it's a good, I don't think it's a good system. Well, I'm being told that our free speech has come to an end. And I, <laughs> I want to thank these panelists for a very lively and very interesting uh, discussion.